We all know something about volcanoes and you might think about something like the scenic Mount Fuji in Japan or maybe Mount Etna in Italy. But actually there's loads of other types of volcanic activity and volcanogenic activity that doesn't create big mountains. And some of that stuff can also be really, really important in creating ore deposits. I'm of course talking about volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits. Volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits, also known as VMS deposits, are typically polymetallic, meaning that they contain many different kinds of metals and elements. As such, VMS deposits are a very significant source the world's base metals, and they are also important also for gold, silver, and trace elements such as tellurium. For example, almost a quarter of global zinc production comes from VMS and other similar deposits. VMS ores are really important globally because they contain lots of the metals that we need in our society today. So, so for example, copper cobalt, lead zinc, tellurium, and all of these things are really important and needed in the energy transition. But let's now have a look at how VMS deposits form. VMS ores are created by hydrothermal events resulting from volcanic activity in submarine environments, particularly in areas where the crust is thinning, such as in back arc basins and mid-ocean reaches. The thinning of the crust is associated with melting of the mantle. Magmas travel upwards and intrude the crust near the surface. When these magmas start to crystallize, the water and other fluids that are dissolved within the magma are released. The heat in the crust also draws in oceanic waters along faults and fractures, and these mix with the magmatic waters. The magmatic fluids themselves can contain many metals already, but the hot fluids will also react with the surrounding ocean floor rocks, picking up more metals. Together, these metal-rich hydrothermal fluids then get transported upwards along faults and fractures in the oceanic crust. Finally, they get near or onto the sea floor via hydrothermal vents. The fluids cool down rapidly as they get near the sea floor, and this causes metallic minerals to precipitate both within the fractured oceanic crust and onto the sea floor, forming a sort of metallic cap on top of the vent. In oceans today, we can observe this phenomenon happening in sulfurous plumes called black smokers like shown in this YouTube video captured by the scientific team of the Nautilus Exploration Program. And you can see how the metal-rich hot fluids enter the sea water, and when that happens, the sulfide minerals get precipitated out of the fluids onto the sea floor. So the metals precipitate in the hot hydrothermal fluids, so they can either penetrate the rocks uh, just underneath the surface as they travel upwards, or they can end up precipitating onto the sea floor from the hydrothermal vents. What we end up with is layers upon layers of metal-rich volcanic and sedimentary material. The layers typically form zones with particular metals dominating each zone. This is because different metallic minerals precipitate at slightly different temperatures. So metals like copper precipitate within or close to the vents in higher temperatures, whereas metals like lead and zinc precipitate farther out in cooler areas. The core of the deposit is usually a so-called stockwork zone, rich in copper and pyrite. And the hot hydrothermal fluids also, of course, interact with and change the chemical composition of the country rock, which are typically basalts and other rocks forming the oceanic crust. This results in an alteration zone, typically rich in chlorite. But this is just an idealized model. 
In fact, there are many different subtypes of VMS deposits, and there is also another closely related deposit type called stratobound sedimentary deposit type, which is also related to hydrothermal activity near the sea floor. I will talk about sedimentary deposits specifically in another video, but many VMS deposits do show characteristics of both volcanogenic and sedimentary deposit types. For example, here in the Iberian pyrite belt. The Iberian pyrite belt is over 200 kilometers long, stretching all the way across southwestern Spain and into Portugal. It contains over 200 known volcanic and sedimentary deposits. Mining has gone on here for thousands of years, and some say that one of the oldest mines in the world are in this region here. And I'm visiting the Rio Tinto area, which is one of the really famous districts within the Pirate Belt. The Rio Tinto area is within the region of Andalusia in southwestern Spain. Rio Tinto itself means stained river, and the area gets its name from the Rio Tinto River that is flowing through the area. The river water is interacting with the sulphite-rich rocks, which causes the river and many of the rocks to obtain its rusty colouring. And the thousands of years of mining activity in the area has enhanced this effect by a drainage of historic mine waters. The water here can get quite acidic as a result, and significant efforts are being made to mitigate the pollution from the historic mining. There are some active mines here still, such as this one just outside the town of Rio Tinto itself. But most of the old mine pits have been backfilled with material from these active mines, remediated and landscaped. But some of the sites have been left for tourists to visit so let's do that and have a look at the rocks themselves. Many of the sites show very colourful rocks, shades of reds, purples and browns. Much of that is caused by supergene weathering, so oxidation of the sulphide minerals in the rocks, particularly the iron sulphides such as pyrite, this is the so-called gosson, the oxidized and weathered layer above the mineralized bedrock. But you can also find some rocks left behind from the mining that have not been as much affected by the weathering. So when you look around in these old mining sites, you can actually still find quite a lot of uh, interesting rocks lying around, like this one, for example. You can still see some of the copper mineralization is now being completely altered. That looks like covalite there. You can still find plenty of evidence of the complex fracturing textures within the rocks themselves, like this one here where you can see the lighter, quartz-rich material being broken up by the fractures carrying the darker material. Some of the fractures clearly carry the copper mineralization, which is here expressed by the blue covalite. But yes, very typical textures for VMS type of mineralization. In other places, you can find more boulders with metallic mineralization. Let's look at some of these to see what the textures in the original rocks are like. So, quite a lot of mineralized boulders here. Very fine grained pyrite in all these grey bits here within the layering of the original rock very clear evidence of lots of hydrothermal fluids coming through the volcanic sedimentary package. In some boulders, 
the original layering is very nicely preserved, like in this one here. The hot hydrothermal fluids, of course, reacted with the surrounding rocks and sediments, changing their composition and mineralogy. So, quite apart from the weathering expressed by the Gossen, the volcanic and sedimentary rocks themselves show pretty intense alteration by the hydrothermal fluids. For example here, the original rock has been completely altered by the hydrothermal fluids, in this case producing the very pale quartz-rich textures that we can see between the pyrite-rich darker domains. The quartz-rich parts of the veins are harder than most of the other minerals, and in some places you can even see how the rest of the vein material has been removed, probably by very acidic hydrothermal fluids, leaving behind just the quartz-rich material. But the pyrite has no real commercial value these days, and the copper ore itself has, of course, been mined out. So let's find out about the actual ore minerals. In the town of Rio Tinto itself, there is a museum where you can learn about the mining history in the area and about the ore mineralization. Romans mined here extensively, but the region has always been a bit of a hotspot for mining. So good specimens in the museum here, but the actual ore that produced the copper and some other metals as well in this Rio Tinto area. The Roman mining and copper mining in general until fairly recently focused on native copper and the copper minerals malachite and azurite because these are much easier to process to get the copper out than copper sulfides. But as the ore processing techniques advanced, sulfide minerals such as charcoal pyrite became the main ore minerals. The main metals produced in this region were copper, silver and gold. It's difficult to estimate how much metals were extracted from here over the thousands of years of activity. But this area, this Rio Tinto district, was the largest copper producing region in the world in the 19th century. But why are there so many VMS and other similar ore deposits in the Rio Tinto area and in the wider Iberian pyrite belt? Well, let's consider what the original geological setting was. Starting more than 400 million years ago, there was a major tectonic event where several ancient continental masses collided with each other. This event formed the supercontinent Pangaea, where most of the continental blocks we know today were joined together. In many areas, such as in present northern France, this resulted in the formation of a mountain belt. But the present southern Spain and Portugal were in an area where the situation was much more complex. Instead of a head-on collision, the continental plates here were sliding past each other, creating extension and rifting of the crust rather than mountains. The rifted basin extended for hundreds of kilometers across the present southern Spain and Portugal, and the associated melts within the mantle intruded the crust, resulting in the formation of VMS and other hydrothermal ore deposits all along the basin. So because these rift systems are so large, the volcanogenic systems within them tend to be quite large as well, and therefore more than one ore deposit normally forms uh, in a large rift system. So you form big, big metallogenic districts in many cases, such as here in the Iberian pirate belt. The movements of the continental plates did eventually change and in the end, convergence and collision did happen here too, and the rift system closed. 
all historically and presently mined VMS deposits are on land, so the old oceanic basins where they originally formed have been caught up in later mountain building events and subsequently exposed by erosion. Many such basins have formed during the billions of years of Earth's history and that is why you can find VMS deposits all around the planet. But the fact that the basins have been involved in later tectonic events also means that the deposits are always very deformed, showing complex geometries and structures. The Rio Tinto district is no exception. Like this cross-section shows, the Rio Tinto and other deposits here, once deposited into the rift, are now extensively folded. So, if you are a geologist looking at VMS and indeed many other ore deposits too, you want to make sure you understand structural geology, which deals with the geometries of Earth materials in three dimensions. This will really help, both in exploration and mining, of deformed ore deposit types. So, what about the VMS deposits of the future then? Well, VMS ores, and indeed all ore deposits, will continue to play a major, major role uh, in our society, especially now as we race to get all the metals we need to enable the energy transition. Most mining exploration today occurs on land, but there are exploration companies that are looking into the possibility to exploit sort of more recent or even modern uh, deposits deep underwater. And that, of course, is not only technically very difficult, but hugely controversial. The fact is that we don't know much about the ecosystems and the environmental conditions of oceans in general. The National Geographic Society has calculated that a far greater percentage of the surfaces of the Moon and the planet Mars have been mapped and studied than our own ocean floor. Without a good understanding of deep ocean ecosystems, it will be very difficult to mitigate the environmental damage of any deep sea mining, particularly as we can't really directly observe the impact of our activities at such great depths. There are many areas in our oceans where possible resources have been identified. There is currently no active deep sea mining operations, but some exploration licenses have been granted, for example, in the Clipperton Fracture Zone in the Pacific Ocean. Well, perhaps in the future, deep sea mining will become inevitable. But I think in the meantime, we should just focus on mining things on land where we can actually see what we're doing. So we can observe and mitigate the impact of our actions. Things like this, historic mining that ravaged the landscape don't have to happen again. Modern mining doesn't have to be like that. We now have all the knowledge and technology we need to prevent pollution during and after mining and to restore the landscape such as is being done here in Spain. It is up to governments to make sure they legislate in a way that requires companies to take their responsibilities seriously and for us consumers to demand that our metals are produced sustainably. The need for metals provided by VMS and indeed other ore deposits is not going to go away and we will have to keep finding new deposits to provide the resources needed for the energy transition.